So let's talk about two different types of reactions that can occur in a cell. The first is the exergonic reaction, and the second is the endergonic reaction. And you can see by the graphs um, of each of these types that we have, first of all, on the y-axis, we have energy that's increasing. And then along the x-axis, we have just time. So in other words, this is the progression of the reaction along the x-axis. And this way, energy is increasing going up. So for a reaction, okay, we have reactants, okay, as our starting material, and we end up with products. So if we look at the exergonic reaction, what we see is we have a certain amount of energy that's, that's potential energy in the bonds of the reactant molecules. And we have a certain amount of energy that's in the bonds of the, and, and provide potential energy in the bonds of the product molecules. And you can see that in an exergonic reaction, there are, there is more energy in the bonds of the reactants than there are in the bonds of the products. But we know that energy can't be created or destroyed, therefore that energy is going somewhere. So in this case, energy is going to be released in the cell. Now the reason that's important in biology is because that energy can be used for the cell to do work. So this, in other words, an exergonic reaction can be put together with or coupled with another reaction that requires energy to drive that reaction forward. Now if we look at the other type of reaction over here, an endergonic reaction, okay, it's the exact opposite. So if you look at the amount of energy in the reactants, in the potential energy of the reactants versus the products, we see that there's more energy in the bonds of the products. Well, that has to come from somewhere. Therefore, for this reaction to go forward, there's going to have to be an input of energy. So the big difference, an exergonic reaction is going to release energy for the cell, and an endergonic reaction is going to require an input of energy into the cell. So these two types of reactions can be coupled together so an exergonic reaction can drive an endergonic reaction in the cell. Now I want to point out something that you should see that's common to both of these reactions, and that is that the reaction doesn't go directly from the amount of energy in the products down to the energy, uh, excuse me, reactants to the products, okay? And it doesn't go directly from reactants to products here. Instead, we have this sort of hump of energy that has to be overcome in order for the reaction to go forward. Okay, that energy is called the energy of activation or activation energy. And this is something that is important when we talk about enzymes because enzymes are going to actually lower the amount of activation energy it takes for a reaction to go forward. So let's look at our same energy diagram. So we have, we have time still this way, right, as the reaction progresses forward. And again, we have energy increasing on the y-axis. And if you'll notice in red, it shows the amount of activation energy that would be required. Now look, this is an exergonic reaction. So this, th this is a reaction that energy is being released. It does not require, it's not an endergonic, okay? But there's a certain amount of energy that needs to um, be provided in order for the reaction to go forward, okay? To get it started, if you will. Now notice with an enzyme, if we follow the black line, it takes much less energy or activation energy in order for this reaction to go forward. And so that's why you will read that an enzyme is a catalyst. In other words, it's getting the reaction moving forward. Now an important thing to know is an enzyme is not used up in the reaction. Okay, An enzyme can can assist in a reaction and then turn around and do the same thing again. It is not in any way used up like you might think of um, a catalyst. For example, lighter fluid that starts a charcoal fire. That catalyst is used up, but an enzyme is not used up. Now let's talk a little more about what an enzyme is and how it works in the cell. Okay, first of all, an enzyme 
is a type of protein. Okay, so there are many types of proteins. There are structural proteins, but an enzyme is a specific type of protein. And with all proteins, the three-dimensional shape of an enzyme is very important. And that is because it is going to provide a perfect fit with a particular substrate. Okay, so just like, um, let's say that you have a key that starts your car. And you also have a key that opens your front door. But they're specific. The key that starts your car does not open your front door, right? They're a one-to-one -one fit. And if you change the three-dimensional shape of the key that opens your front door and you file off some of those ridges, it will no longer open your front door. And an enzyme is the same way. Because the three-dimensional shape is so important to the molecule that it binds, if you change the shape, it no longer um, provides the function that it should in the cell because it won't fit the substrate. Now, this diagram, okay, in, in this gray area shows the enzyme. So the three-dimensional shape is represented by this portion here that's called the active site. The active site of an enzyme is what binds its substrate molecule. And you can see that the substrate is a perfect fit for this active site for the enzyme. Now, once the enzyme and substrate are bound together, it's called an enzyme-substrate complex. And what happens is there's a slight change when they bind that makes them... Um, bind even even tighter okay and it's called induced fit model when these two come together now the reason that the one of the reasons that the enzyme lowers the activation energy is because it brings the substrate into close proximity okay and so in this case we see now we have a product that's produced from the substrate so the enzyme has catalyzed that reaction but the enzyme is unchanged. The products can be released, and this same enzyme can come back and bind a new substrate to produce those products again. Now, there are things in the cell that can occur that will change the three-dimensional shape of an enzyme. And when that happens, we call it denatured. The, the enzyme has become denatured. It's not killed, right? It's not dead because an enzyme is not living. The smallest living thing is a cell and an enzyme is found inside of the cell. But denatured means that its three-dimensional shape is altered and so it can no longer bind to its substrate. Some of the ways that an enzyme will become denatured is when there are changes in pH. All enzymes have an optimal pH which they function best and if it gets too far outside of that range then their, their three-dimensional shape can change. Same with temperature. All enzymes have an optimum temperature, and if it's outside of that range, there can be problems. Okay, salt concentrations can also cause problems for a three-dimensional shape of an enzyme. Now, I also want to talk to you a little bit about what we call feedback inhibition. And this occurs when the product of an enzyme actually serves to, to inhibit the process. Now what I want you to see here is many times in the cell, multiple enzymes act together and we call it a metabolic pathway. So for example, we have a substrate here and the substrate then is recognized by the, the enzyme. This enzyme is the enzyme for this particular substrate and it catalyzes the reaction that changes substrate into this particular product. But the product of enzyme 1 is also the substrate for the next enzyme in the pathway, which is enzyme 2. Enzyme 2 catalyzes that reaction and produces this product, which is now the substrate for the third enzyme in the pathway. Okay, And this enzyme then catalyzes the reaction and this is the final product in the pathway. Now feed feedback inhibition is when the product of the pathway actually serves to inhibit or stop the enzyme, excuse me, an enzyme in the pathway. So for example, this first enzyme, okay, that catalyzes this first reaction, the end product binds to that 
enzyme and causes it to change its shape and therefore can no longer bind the substrate. So this would be inhibiting the pathway. Now this makes sense in the cell if you think about the cell is expending energy to produce this product. So why produce the product when it's not needed? Well, when there's an excess of product, it's essentially going to shut off the pathway so that it will not make any more of that product when it's not needed. However, when the product is depleted, okay, and it can no longer, there's not enough around to bind up the enzyme, then the pathway begins to go forward and you have more production of that product.